Hey, security leaders and tech trailblazers, welcome back to the channel where we break down top interview questions and sharpen your edge one cybersecurity role at a time. Today's spotlight, one of the most strategic and high impact roles in modern enterprise environments, security solution architect with a focus on identity and access management or IAM. Whether preparing for your next big interview or wanting to master IAM design in hybrid and cloud environments, you're in the right place. We're exploring real world questions and expert answers, the kind you'll encounter during workshops, stakeholder interviews, or panel discussions. So let's jump right. What is the primary role of a security solution architect IAM? As a security solution architect specializing in IAM, my primary role is to design and guide the implementation of identity and access management solutions that align with both business goals and security requirements. I act as the strategic bridge between technical execution and organizational risk management. I design end-to-end -end identity and access management solutions that align with business strategy, reduce risk, and ensure compliance. That includes everything from SSO and MFA to PAM, IGA, and directory integration across cloud and on-prem. I also lead workshops, conduct due diligence, and validate technical feasibility with key stakeholders. What's the difference between authentication and authorization? Authentication verifies who you are. Authorization decides what you can access. I like to say, authentication hands you the key. Authorization tells you which doors it opens. What are the top encryption algorithms used these days? One, AES-256 is my default for symmetric encryption. It's fast, secure, FIPS compliant, and ideal for protecting data at rest or secrets in cloud native systems. Two, I use RSA, 2048 or 496 bit keys, for secure key exchange and digital signatures, especially in PKI and TLS environments, though it's slower than newer alternatives. Three, ECC elliptic curve cryptography. ECC offers strong security with smaller key sizes, Due to its efficiency and reduced bandwidth usage, it is perfect for mobile apps, JWTs, and modern TLS setups. Four, SHA-256, SHA-3 hashing. While not encryption, I rely on SHA algorithms for secure password hashing and token integrity, typically layered with bcrypt or argon2. Bottom line, I tailor encryption choices to each use case, focusing on performance, compliance, and proven security always avoiding deprecated algorithms like MD5 or DES. How do you design scalable identity architecture for multi-cloud environments? I start with centralized identity, typically using Azure AD or Okta. Then I federate access using SIML OIDC across AWS, Azure, and GCP. Automation is key, using SIM, JML workflows, and provisioning connectors. I also prioritize policy consistency and logging across providers. What are the key components of a zero trust architecture in IAM? For me, zero trust in IAM starts with continuous identity verification, strict access segmentation, and adaptive policy enforcement. I use conditional access, risk-based MFA, and session revocation tied to user behavior analytics. How do you approach role-based access control, RBAC, versus attribute-based access control, ABAC? RBAC is great for operational simplicity. Define roles, assign permissions. ABAC gives you finer control with context, like time, device, or location. I use RBAC as a baseline and layer ABAC for high-risk scenarios. What are the steps involved in the process of access termination? Access termination is a critical part of the identity lifecycle, especially in regulated environments. Whether a user leaves the organization or a contractor's engagement ends, I follow a structured deprovisioning process to ensure security, compliance, and auditability. Here's how I approach it. First, I trigger the termination event. The process typically starts with a trigger, usually an update in the HR system or an IT ticket. Then immediately upon termination, I terminate all active sessions, web, VPN, remote desktop, using identity providers like Okta or Azure AD and CASB tools. This helps prevent any ongoing access from being misused. Next, I disable the user's primary and linked accounts across AD, SaaS apps, cloud platforms, and admin portals. I always start with disabling before deletion, so nothing breaks if the account is still linked to shared systems. I revoke elevated access from PAM tools like CyberArk or Beyond Trust and remove any temporary JIT access. 
I also check for service accounts or API keys tied to the user. I notify IT to collect company-issued assets, laptops, tokens, smart cards, and ensure mobile device access is wiped using MDM tools like Intune or Jamf. Finally, I archive the user's data per retention policy and generate a deprovisioning audit report, especially for compliance with SOX, HIPAA, or GDPR. This audit trail is key during internal reviews or external audits. In short, access termination isn't just about disabling a user. It's about protecting sensitive systems, maintaining operational continuity, and closing any back doors. Why are time constraints used in authentication? Time constraints in authentication are a critical part of strengthening identity security and reducing the attack surface. I use them to enforce the principle of least privilege, not just in terms of access level, but also access duration. There are several reasons why time-bound authentication is essential. One, mitigating risk of credential abuse. If a token or session is compromised, time constraints limit how long that access is valid. Two, supporting just-in-time JIT access. In many environments I've worked in, especially those with privileged users, I implement JIT access models where users only get elevated permissions for a specific task or time window. Once that window expires, access is automatically revoked without requiring manual intervention. Three, enforcing compliance and audit readiness. Regulations like SOX, HIPAA, and ISO 27001 often require proof of how long access was granted and whether it aligned with legitimate business needs. Time constraints help me demonstrate that access was temporary, auditable, and well-governed. For reducing standing privileges, instead of leaving admin or elevated permissions assigned indefinitely, I use time-based constraints, for example, four hours of access during a deployment window, which helps eliminate unnecessary standing privileges and aligns with zero trust principles. How do you handle federated identity between external partners and your environment? I typically use SAML or OIDC to federate with a partner's IDP and enforce access via B2B or B2C models in Azure or Okta. I make sure contract terms include identity validation standards and log retention policies. What's your strategy for managing privileged accounts? First, I identify all privileged identities, human and machine. Then I vault them using CyberArk or Beyond Trust. I enforce just-in-time elevation, session recording and approval workflows. Monitoring and alerting are non-negotiable. Which IAM tools and platforms are you proficient with? I've worked with Okta, Azure AD, Ping Identity, CyberArk, Beyond Trust for Palm, SailPoint, Savient for Iga, HashiCorp Vault for Secrets, AWS IAM, Azure RBSA, GCP IAM for Cloud Access Control. What are the key disadvantages of passwordless authentication? Passwordless authentication is a big leap forward in security and user experience and I've helped several organizations adopt it using biometrics, FIDO2 keys, magic links, and push notifications. But like any security model, it's not without trade-offs. Here are the key disadvantages I always consider before implementation. One, dependency on devices or infrastructure. Most passwordless methods rely on a user's device, like a phone, biometric reader, or hardware key. If that device is lost, broken, or unavailable, Users can be locked out unless there's a robust fallback process in place. Two, onboarding and recovery challenges. Initial enrollment and account recovery can be more complex than just resetting a password. Three, limited compatibility with legacy systems. Not all applications, especially older or on-prem systems, support modern passwordless protocols like FIDO2 or WebAuthn. In those cases, I often have to build hybrid solutions or maintain a reduced password-based fallback, which can add complexity. Four, user resistance and training. Users who are accustomed to traditional login methods may resist change or get confused by new workflows, especially in large or non-technical user bases. Five, higher initial cost. Setting up passwordless systems often requires an upfront investment in hardware tokens like YubiKeys, biometric infrastructure, or identity orchestration platforms. The long-term ROI is usually strong, but budget approval can be a hurdle in some organizations. What can a solutions architect do to support functional analysts? In my experience working with functional analysts, my role as a solutions architect is to serve as both a technical translator and a strategic partner. 
I actively bridge the gap between business requirements and technical implementation. And FAs are key to making that connection work. Here's how I support them day to day. One, translating requirements into architecture. I work closely with FAs to understand the business processes and use cases they're mapping out. I help translate those into secure, scalable IAM architecture, whether it's designing access workflows, federation strategies, or integration with HR systems. Two, providing technical clarity and feasibility. When functional analysts gather requirements or user stories, I support them by validating feasibility, identifying edge cases, security implications, and technical constraints that might not be visible from a business-only perspective. Three, collaborating on solution workshops. In joint workshops or design sessions, I keep the conversation moving productively, ensuring FAs feel heard while guiding stakeholders toward realistic solutions that meet both business and security goals. Explain what tools you use to perform the duties of a solutions architect. Why do you use them and what do they do? As a security solutions architect, particularly in IAM, I use various tools across architecture design, identity management, documentation, and collaboration. Each tool I use is chosen to enhance accuracy, speed, stakeholder clarity, and security alignment. Here's a breakdown of the tools I rely on and why. One, architecture and design tools. Microsoft Visio, Draw.io. I use these to diagram system architectures, trust boundaries, identity flows, and access models. Visuals are critical when aligning with functional analysts, engineers, and business stakeholders. Two, I am in directory tools. Azure AD, Okta, Ping Identity. These are my go-to platforms for directory management, federation, SSO, and conditional access policies. I configure and test real-world identity workflows here, including JIT provisioning and B2B collaboration. SailPoint, Savint. For identity governance, access certification, and policy simulation across hybrid environments. CyberArk, HashiCorp Vault. I use these tools for managing privileged access and secrets. They help enforce zero standing privilege and control access to sensitive assets. Three, collaboration and documentation tools. Confluence, SharePoint. I use these for documenting architecture decisions, security policies, and stakeholder notes, making sure everything is traceable. Jira, Azure DevOps. For aligning with Agile teams, tracking IAM user stories, and managing sprint deliverables. Miro, they're great for remote architecture workshops, whiteboarding, and stakeholder ideation. Four, cloud and infrastructure tools. AWS IAM, Azure RBAC, GCP IAM. I use these tools for cloud native access control design, mapping out lease privilege, IAM roles, service principles, and workload identity federation. Five, security and testing tools. Burp Suite or Postman. For testing authentication flows, OAuth tokens, and API security, especially in OpenID Connect and SML integrations. Zonar Cube, SNCC. Fortify. To ensure code and configurations are secure and aligned with security architecture standards. I believe in using the right tool for the right job, but I also prioritize tools that integrate well across teams, so our security decisions are not isolated, but collaborative, trackable, and actionable. And there you have it, the top 20 IAM interview questions and answers for a security solution architect role. Whether you're preparing for a client workshop or a panel interview, Use these questions to prepare confidently and clearly. Do you have follow-up questions? Would you like a video comparing tools like Okta versus Azure AD or CyberArk versus Beyond Trust? Comment below. If you found this helpful, please like, subscribe, and share it with your fellow cybersecurity pros. Until next time, stay secure, stay sharp.